Hi guys, this is Dr. Ellie Porosef and I'm going to be doing the Snapchat takeover for med takeovers today and I am an audiologist. An audiologist's minimum degree requirement now is a doctorate degree. It used to be a master's level minimum but over the past 10 years or so it has become a doctorate level. An audiologist specializes with disorders of the inner ear which houses both the hearing and the balance. For me personally, I got my bachelor um, and my doctor both at the University of Texas in Austin. I got my bachelor in communication sciences and disorders and my doctorate in Austin. I'm a fast talker, but this is still even a little hard for me to squeeze it in in 10 seconds. So here we go. <laughs> so I have my own private practice right now um, and hopefully forever and hopefully many locations. It's called Memorial Hearing. So I primarily work with diagnosis. So mainly I diagnose hearing loss and then I treat it. So if somebody, for example, needs amplification because they have hearing loss, then they'll get hearing aids. So I'm about to see a patient. In fact, I'm running a few minutes late, so I'm going to take a little Snapchat takeover break. And he's about to get some amazing hearing aids. Um, and I'll show you them later. I can't, I can't show you these later because he's going to be leaving with them. So I'll show you them real quick right now. These are how tiny they are. And I'll talk more about hearing aids and a lot of other things soon. Hi guys, I'm back for just a minute and then I have another patient. Um, so the degree as far as the time uh, needed to t take it is four years. Four years for undergrad or however long it takes you to finish your undergrad. Um, and then four years for your doctorate degree. Much like getting your degree if you were to go to any other school besides med school, such as getting your degree in dentistry or pharmacy, it's four years after your bachelor's, so a total of eight. Personally, I knew I wanted to do something in the medical field um, or health related. I just knew that it couldn't be very invasive. It sounds stupid, but I just can't deal with blood and I knew that already. I'll take earwax over blood any day. Uh, one thing I do want to say, I've been getting a lot of messages about fans of Married to Medicine Houston. Thank you all so much for your support. I'm glad you guys are watching these. Okay, so I want to do a few comparisons. Uh, first, I want to compare an audiologist to an ENT, ear, nose, and throat. Much like, I would say the best analogy for, the f for this would be, so much like uh, the difference between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist, the optometrist goes to a school, I believe it's for four years, and they get their degree in optometry, whereas, and by four years, I mean four years after, this is all after college. Um, whereas an ophthalmologist also goes to school after college. They go to medical school, but then they have further, a little bit further schooling after that. So same thing. So we go to school for four years after college, and then that's it. We get our degree. Whereas an ear, nose, and throat physician, they go to medical school, um, and then they have, they have to specialize. They do residencies and things like that. So they're in school longer. And they deal with the ear, nose, and throat, where we're mostly dealing with the ear, hearing, hearing imbalance. Um, so they have their MD. We have our AUD. Or or some audiologists have their PhD, um, and so you can get either a doctorate. The AUD is definitely more clinical, whereas the PhD can be used more for being a professor. Although the AUD degree, AU is audiology, D is doctorate, so the doctorate of audiology degree can also be a professor. Um, but anyway, the PhD is just more research-oriented, I would say. You will still see some audiologists out there with their master's degrees. They've been grandfathered in. They can still practice. They know just as much as we do, but we had to add the doctorate level because we needed more schooling with the vestibular portion or dealing with the inner ear portion where that deals with the dizzy patients. So because of that, we had more education. Anyway, back to my comparison. So I would say an ENT can't do their job properly if they don't have an audiologist on board um, or if they don't refer out to an audiologist. When because an ear, nose, and throat physician, they do most of the surgeries, and if, um, if medications needed, they'll prescribe. But for the testing and diagnosis, then the ENT would need an audiologist. So um, it's it's just very common to see at an ENT office that there's an audiologist there working. So to recap, if you want to be more invasive, if you want to deal with surgeries, then you should go into being an ear, nose, and throat physician. Otherwise, audiology is a Another uh, thing that sometimes we get compared to are HIS, or hearing instrument specialists. Um, that's a whole other topic, but we'll get into that for a minute. So to be fair, although um, we as audiologists, a lot of us work with hearing aids, dispensers or hearing aid dispensers were the ones that worked with hearing aids before we did. I believe, and I could be wrong, but it was somewhere, sometime in the 80s where we also added uh, dealing with hearing aids to our repertoire. So we primarily deal with hearing aids as well now. 
Uh, but unlike a dispenser, we do much more than just hearing aids. Again, we uh, deal with some of the stuff that's going on as far as diseases of the ear and dealing with the balance, whereas a hearing aid dispenser does just that. They dispense hearing aids. Um, they will do hearing exams. And so it's a great field to get into if you don't want to go to school if you don't want to go to school as long as it would take to get your doctorate in audiology. So that's another option. Um, but as audiologists, we deal with not only the hearing, but also the balance. Okay, so I'm going to try to address as many of the questions that I'm getting as possible. So as far as salary, like if you Google what does an audiologist make, it definitely seems to be a lot lower than what we really make. And I don't know if I'm speaking for myself, but or maybe it's the town I'm in, but I don't think any audiologist makes less than the like minimal six figures. Some places have uh, structures in place, so if, you, or if you're working with hearing aids a lot, um, it can definitely be more lucrative uh, because there's a product being uh, sold. And of course, if you're in private practice, I mean, you're basically writing your own paycheck. There, the sky is the limit on how much you can make. You can make millions. So as far as my practice, I see a variety of different um, types of patients. I see new patients. I do hearing aid fittings, and then I do a lot of follow-ups. So basically, I try to kind of splice up my day like that. Um, maybe like, I don't know, 12 patients a day, I would say, roughly. I do definitely like to leave more time with my patients. So I know I could definitely be seeing more. Some people see maybe 30 patients a day. But I leave enough time to get to know my new patients. I love to talk. And I think that's really important. Honestly, it doesn't matter what you are in life or what you do. But if you are good at what you do, if you're passionate about what you do, and you're good to the people that that come see you, then I think you can be really successful. I mean, it really will show. If your provider cares about you, they take the time to, you know, just talk to you and get to know you, it will show. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the vestibular portion. Um, when I used to work in the ENT setting, which I did for many years, um, I would definitely have to deal with a lot of dizzy patients. So I'm going to be real. I'm not a big fan of that. And so I chose to be in private practice and dealing with mostly hearing loss, not balance. There are a variety of tests, a whole test battery that will see which type of dizziness a patient could have so that depending on what the test shows, we can see if we can treat it. Some of the vestibular battery tests can take a long time. I mean, you can be in a dark room for like three or four hours with a patient. I personally hated doing that. So one of the tests that we use um, is an ENG, it's electronystagmography, and it will help us look at the nystagmus of the eye to see what's going on. Nystagmus is when the eye is going like that kind of shooting, darting really quickly uh, from side to side. And so we will have electrodes on the head. And so in order to elicit the nystagmus, sometimes or basically what we're doing is making the patient dizzy on purpose. And that's definitely not fun. Not fun for them. Not fun for us. There are a few images um, of some different electrode placements. There's also VNG instead of ENG. So that's a VNG. That's video nystagmography. So that's kind of a newer thing. And by the way, I can't say that word right, so if there's any audiologists watching, which I know there are, don't make fun of me! The biggest point I want to say about balance is that there is something that could be, not e I don't want to say easily, but really fixed efficiently for patients that are dizzy. That is if the patient has BPPV, or benign proximal positional vertigo. If a patient has BPPV, there's a maneuver that we can do called the Epley maneuver. But the Epley only works if you have true BPPV, and usually uh, people get that if they're, you know, bump their head somewhere hard, and it knocks the little crystals loose in your inner ear. So the inner ear houses both the hearing and the balance. So the uh, inner ear is right there, that little blue area. The cochlea, the snail-like, is your hearing. And then the semicircular canals is where your balance is housed. So inner ear houses both your hearing and your balance. Isn't that cool? And while I leave you for a minute to go get another patient, visit my Instagram. It's at Dr. Ellie, and I have my business one at Memorial Hearing, um, or my Snapchat at Dr. Ellie. Okay, so actually, before I leave, I want to show y'all one thing. This is really, really important, and I will address this when I come back. It's very, very important. I just want to show, take a second and show you guys my view. This is the beautiful Houston with lots of freeways, but also lots of... I'm gonna try to get like a quick bite to eat for like two seconds. Oh, hey, how's it going? Let's talk hearing aids, shall we?
Okay, I'm going to talk to you just briefly about hearing aids. Um, these are some of the styles. And by the way, I always have coffee. Oh, and this is my little Persian rug coaster. I'm Persian, by the way. Uh, and by the way, the boxes in the background, that's what a typical audiologist's desk looks like. Always full of boxes with hearing aids and other stuff to deal with. Okay, so here we go. All these beautiful before I talk about hearing aids, I want to discuss um, real quickly actual hearing loss. Let me pull out a little chart here. Okay, so when we test a, a patient's hearing, we test it usually two different ways. The first way is the way we normally hear sounds as humans, which is by air conduction. This is my little mini sound booth. Anyway, air conduction testing is done with the headphones, and basically what we're trying to do is measure the way that sound flows, just like we would hear as humans. Sound goes down the ear down the ear canal, vibrates the eardrum, stimulates the bones behind the eardrum, which will stimulate the hair cells of your inner ear, which will signal to your brain that you're hearing. So it goes from outer ear to middle ear to inner ear. Here, so that's how we test the hearing. Then we do a second test, and that's testing the hearing by bone conduction. And that's with this little guy right here. And what that does, what it does is it stimulates the inner ear directly. So we're putting this little piece here on the mastoid bone. It's a bone oscillator. It oscillates basically your head, and it stimulates the inner so, to do a proper exam, it's really important to do the hearing test by air conduction and also by bone conduction. Because by skipping the outer ear and the middle ear and going directly to the nerve, discrepancies. So, for example, if you do it by air conduction, you get one result. Then you skip this whole area and you go directly to the nerve and you get a better result. That will tell us that maybe there's something going on like... That will tell us there's something going on like fluid, for example, backed up behind the eardrum. Or let's say the bones of the eardrum are stiff. That's otosclerosis. So, if that happens, we refer to an ear, nose, and... And that's why with children, you'll see that sometimes they'll get the fluid buildup behind the eardrum. And so what they'll do, the ENT will put a tube into the eardrum and allow the fluid to come out a different way. So the point of what I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes you can have hearing loss, but it doesn't have to be nerve related. It could be something temporary like fluid or something else that maybe an ENT can just fix. So before I stick a pair of hearing aids on a patient, I obviously want to make sure that um, it's either a loss that can't be fixed or, you know, it's pure nerve loss that needs to be term for nerve loss is sensory neural hearing loss um, and that's basically hearing loss in the inner ear and there's no treatment for that at this time medically. Hello, I have heard that they're doing studies to somehow regenerate the hair cells of the inner ear. So I guess until then I still have a job. Woohoo! Mostly kidding. Just like LASIK didn't put optometrists out of a job, I'm sure I'll still have a job. But no, yeah, but it's, it's interesting and I'm excited. Till then... We are going to talk about hearing aids. Yee-hoo! All right, so there's different styles of hearing aids. There's your conventional behind-the-ear style that will have, like, an ear mold attached. Then you have your newer styles here. They call them RICs or RITES, receiver in the ear, receiver in the ear. So you have your custom hearing aids. I'm actually not a big fan of custom hearing aids, and I guess I'll tell you all why. Uh, a lot of people, not everybody, this is not generalizing, but a lot of people have this looking hearing hearing loss where they have some hearing that's normal. Okay, just realize I didn't tell y'all what an audiogram is. Audiogram is a hearing test. Um, usually the um, we do each ear either separately on a paper or together. Right ear is red, left so The frequency is on the x-axis. Intensity or volume is on the y-axis. So from left to right, just like a piano, it goes from low pitch to high pitch on this graph. And then from top to bottom on the intensity, it goes from very soft to very loud. So something that's 10 dB is very, very soft volume. Something that's like 110 dB is a very, very loud volume. So basically, the point of doing this hearing test, besides making sure there's nothing else going on, is to see how soft you can actually hear the sounds. We're going to go pitch by pitch by pitch and see how If you can hear any frequency at the volume of 25 decibels or softer, going up, softer, that means you have normal hearing in those frequencies. If the volume for any of the frequencies tested, which is usually from 250 hertz low pitch to 8,000 hertz high pitch, if it has to be made greater than 25 dB, that means you have a hearing loss. So right below normal hearing, we call this a mild hearing loss. This area, moderate hearing loss, moderately severe, severe, and of course, profound hearing loss. Which reminds me, a lot of people ask, do I have to know ASL or American Sign Language or Sign Language when you're an audiologist? When somebody needs to use sign language, Chances are um, they either have at least a severe or maybe severe to profound or a profound hearing loss in every frequency, so it's hard for them to communicate otherwise.
Meaning somebody who, you know, we use the word hard of hearing for patients who are hearing aids, but if they're deaf, their hearing may be basically all the way down here in every frequency. So that being said, most audiologists, I'm not speaking for all audiologists, there's plenty of audiologists that work with uh, patients who are actually deaf, but most audiologists actually don't deal with, don't deal with uh, deaf patients as much as people think we do. We actually deal with hard of hearing patients more. We don't have to know sign language, but it's really nice. So, for example, me in particular, I mean, I went to University of Texas, which has, actually has a huge deaf community. The Texas School for the Deaf, TSD, is actually in Austin, and I could not get into an could not get into an ASL class. I actually ended up taking ASL just out of, out of my own time at a local church so I could learn it just in case. Um, and it was really interesting. As it was not, also was not a uh, requirement for my degree. Although I did have to take deaf education um, in undergrad and that taught me a lot. I know I'm veering off topic, but this does kind of bring me, remind me about uh, just kind of a quick touch on cochlear implants. As audiologists, we also work with cochlear implants. And uh, a cochlear implant is totally different than a hearing aid. It's an actually pretty invasive surgery, um, and it replaces the inner ear function. Uh, and it does that by uh, the insertion of electrodes in the inner ear area that stimulate the uh, hair cells differently. And the cochlear implant is put in by an ENT, and again, they're the ones that do the surgery, and then the audiologist does all the everything else afterwards. A lot of those YouTube videos and stuff that you may see about people hearing for the first time, I mean, sometimes it's a hearing aid, but a lot of times they're getting their cochlear implants. I actually did my externship at a cochlear implant place in Austin, and the differences were pretty pretty drastic, depending on if the patient had if the patient had hearing loss um, before they were able to speak, or were they postlingually deafened, or hearing loss. And that's kind of what the debate is. The deaf community does, do not consider themselves as having a disability. They are very proud of being deaf, and they consider themselves a community. So with all these uh, newborn hearing screenings and uh, little babies being, their hearing loss is being caught early on, parents are making decisions to implant their children. So that will make basically the, the deaf community smaller. And uh, again, because they don't see themselves as having a disability, uh, it so I'm just going to kind of end this topic about the cochlear Im implants by saying that um, if there's speech prior to the hearing loss, then the chance of them doing better with their cochlear implant drastically improves, whereas if somebody's been deaf all their lives and at the age of 40 they want to get a cochlear and that person who's um, who waited till like let's say they're older and then they get a cochlear implant, um, it's going to you know have a, a tougher time because their brain's not used to the sound. They're Okay, so where was I? Back to hearing aids. I get on these, um, what do you call those things? My brain's dead right now. When you go off on a tangent, I go on a tangent. So, because we, not all the time, but most commonly see this, what we call ski slope audiogram, which is a totally uh, informal term for it, as audiologists we call it that, we see so we see either normal low frequency hearing or let's say mild hearing loss. So we want to try to keep the ear canal as open as possible. We don't want to shove it. We don't want to shove um, one of these custom hearing aids down the canal and stop that sound from naturally going in if a patient has either normal or near normal low frequency sound. So we put a hearing aid behind the ear, but it's not your conventional behind the ear because it doesn't have a thick tubing. And the part that goes in your ear, there's no big thick ear mold either. So basically sounds that you can hear normally or near normally will go in naturally as if you didn't even have a hearing aid because your ear is not completely plugged up. And then the sounds that you're having hearing loss will get amplified because the hearing aids will be digitally programmed to help you with that. You know, like my evil eye, by the way. And oh my God, I'm so sorry about my nails this week. I took them off. So the receiver and the canal style has become the most common style nowadays. This is the more traditional one with the actual ear mold that you used to see more of. Full shell, half shell, and of course, and of course you're completely in the canal, which is this size. And they even make them tinier now. It's IIC, which is like, in the canal, I don't even know what it stands for. So for me, I am really particular about what hearing aids I give my patients. I, I, I fight them to the nail to explain to them which ones. 
will work with their hearing and which ones won't. I mean, I'm, I don't want a patient to dictate to me what exactly they need to have because they don't know sometimes. But at the same time, I do understand that some people just don't want something behind their ear. And even though I think this is way more cosmetically appealing than this, because you could still see that some of it, at the end of the day, it's important that the patient wear their hearing aids. So if by me forcing them to get the style that they don't want means they won't wear it, then I, I shouldn't do that. And the main reason I'm kind of against these is it's so small that only has room for one microphone. Um, and the behind the ears have two microphones, so it helps with background noise. And also because it's custom made, you're basically shoving it down your ear canal. So it's um, physically stopping sound from naturally getting through your ear. So sometimes people with a better low frequency hearing, if they wear something that doesn't keep their ear open, if they're like closing it up with something like that, they feel stopped up. So I'm going to get off on that tangent because I'm very passionate about what I do. And if somebody's lucky enough to have me as their audiologist, they will know. Because, you know, I think about it this way. Once, you know, legally in the state of Texas and most states, you have to have at least 30 days to try hearing aids. And once that trial period is over, you are stuck with those hearing aids. And basically, if you're stuck with those hearing aids, chances are that means you're stuck with me. And guess what? I'm stuck with you right back. So if we're going to work with each other for the next five to seven years, which is about how long hearing aids last, although I have patients who get some every two to three years, I don't want you to be unhappy for years and complain every two seconds that you hate your hearing aids. So I'm going to try to address a few more things that we do. Um, like I said, I'm in private practice, and I chose to do mostly diagnostics and treatment. But there's a lot of other things. I've already addressed some of them, um, such as like the vestibular system. Uh, we also do uh, electrophysiology, so testing, like, for example, ABRs. So I'm not going to get too technical, but an ABR stands for auditory brainstem response. And audiologists do the testing. It's basically testing the electrical activity of the brain by looking at the waveforms of the brain uh, after introducing auditory stimulus. And there's many reasons why we would do ABRs. It's mostly useful for um, objective, very objective ways to measure. So not just subjective by doing a verbal auditory exam. Okay, so here's some examples of ABRs. Um, you can see the electrodes put on the head. Um, it's good for babies who fail their uh, hearing screening. And we are looking for uh, a pattern to the wave, uh, the waveforms. And I'm not going to sit here again and get all technical. Um, but it's, it's another way to... So it's more about evaluating the physio uh, physiological uh, function of the cochlea and the auditory nerve. We don't use this every day. There are other tests as well, um, other objective measures, like for newborns, for example, we also use OAEs, autoacoustic emissions, lots of stuff. So as you can see, our scope of practice is quite large. Um, we can do sermon management, remove earwax, that's what that means. Uh, we can also this thing once, I'm going to go off on a tangent, and it was like this guy, he was rapping for this group of us, and he was like, as long as this is a room and you know business will be booming. So another real talk, um, with audiology being relatively a new field to have its um, a minimum of a doctorate requirement, we unfortunately times are not, uh, let's say, taken as seriously as other doctors. So the term doctor, for those that don't know, historically was refer uh, reserved for PhD doctors, not physicians as we know them as doctors today. So technically speaking, your doctor, the professor doctor at your university, was called a doctor before your physician doctor at the office. So again, I don't mean to keep doing uh, analogies, but sometimes analogies are the easiest way to explain things. Much like an optometrist or a pharmacist, we too have our doctorates. And if you don't know, now you know. By the way, check out my beautiful frames. Hook em! So, yeah. Uh, we have earned our doctorate degree, and we are doctors. We're not physicians, but we are doctors. And just to just bring up the, the TV show that I was on on Bravo um, a few months back, and by the way, you can still catch it. I think if, it's, if you didn't get it on demand, you can put it on, like, um, the topic did come up about, uh, you know, if I was a real doctor. <clears throat> and uh, so what? And, you know, I had to defend myself. Go me, yay me, against somebody 
So yeah, catch up on, uh, I guess it's on Amazon Fire Stick and iTunes. So to uh, keep addressing some of y'all's questions, for as far as like if you want to go into audiology, um, for undergrad, the I guess the best way if your school has the program would be to get it in communication, sciences, and disorders, CSD. And that way you're getting rid of your prerequisites while you're getting your degree. You can get your degree in anything. But if you're not, sorry, I'm messing with my hair. But if you're not meeting your prerequisites, then you're not going to get into then you're not going to get into the program. So it's important to meet your prerequisites. Uh, you also have to take your GRE, uh, and I took a prep course for my GRE so I can make the highest score possible. Um, that's important too. And of course, the high GPA. And while you're an undergrad, like if you take a CSD undergrad, Communication Sciences and Disorders, um, you're also going to learn a lot about speech pathology, SLP. So it's kind of nice because you can learn about audiology and speech language pathology, and you can kind of decide at the end which route you want to go. At this time, SLP is still a master's level degree. For me, there was absolutely no question. I knew right away I wanted to do audiology. There were some people who were torn and didn't know which route they wanted to take. And there's a couple of people who actually got both degrees. Crazy. And I guess from my experience, the reason I knew I was definitely more audiology is because it's definitely more concrete. Whereas uh, being an SLP, for me, it seemed way more abstract as far as the therapy. So, yeah, our scope is quite wide. I can work in many different settings, hospital setting, ear, nose, and throat setting, private practice, educational. I could work in educational as far as, like, being an actual professor at a, like, in a university. But you can also work at, like, elementary schools and in that type of educational audiology practice. As the day's going on, my hair's getting fizzier and fizzier. So, yeah, there's just so many things you can do. The sky's the limit. Yay. In undergrad, I learned about uh, speech pathology and audiology, and when I picked audiology for grad school, we did a lot of, you know, coursework the first couple of years. And then throughout the next couple of years, we also had, obviously, co coursework and things like that, but we also had rotations in different settings, and then the final year was a full externship. So although I will say the most common, or what I seem to think is the most common, is working in an ENT office or with an ear, nose, and throat physician, um... There are still so many settings, so if you'd like to be in a hospital, you can do that. You can even do preoperative monitoring. I'm not going to get into that, but you can look it up if you want. There's just so many things you can do. But one thing I'd like to say, just kind of on behalf of the what I do, um, and most audiologists, when we work with patients, is that we give it our all. Much like many providers, I mean, we care. We want to make sure everything is done right. We want to make sure if there's anything that needs to be caught, we catch it or refer it. And we take the time. I know personally I take probably a little bit longer than a lot of other providers. I take an hour and a half with new patients and an hour and a half on my hearing aid fittings. You know, we provide a service. We're not just selling a product. Obviously, I told you about other forms of audiology. But, for example, when dealing with hearing aids, we're not just selling a product. Intricate steps are taken to ensure that the patient knows exactly what everything is and to make sure that they're comfortable because we're dealing with one of your senses. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. I hope you guys enjoyed my snaps today. And I'm not saying goodbye. I might be back. I don't so yeah, I didn't, you know, sign up for a reality TV show because I don't like to yap. So yeah, if you want to follow me and learn more about me, please feel free. My handle is Dr. Ellie. That's doctor spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R. Ellie is spelled E-L-L-Y. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Wilson. Follow me today for uh, a day in the life of a surgeon. We're going to have so much fun. Let's do it. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Dr. Miami is in the house. Dr. Bobby here. This is Barry Miller. Dr. Majestic here. Dr. Antonio Webb. My name is Erin Jensen. Student Dr. Diva. White coat wardrobe. Dr. Lara Devkin. Dr. Sheila Nazarian. Dr. Desiree Yaston. Today, I'm going to be showing you guys a day in the life of a dentist. Psychiatrist, life surgeon, emergency medicine physician, CRNA, dermatology resident, dermatology PA, medical student, emergency room nurse, orthopedic surgeon, surgical physician assistant, plastic surgeon, certified nurse midwife, doctor of physical therapy, a dermatology resident. Just got to the uh, first hospital. So I work eight or ten hour shifts. It's nursing a bad career. Let's give you a little peek at my schedule. Our crash cart. This is gold. I use this all the time. This is one of the 3D tools we use. 
you guys, thanks for following me along today. All right, you guys, I think that is it for me today. Thank you all for watching. Medicine is a very special profession.